Welcome, children. Ghostman Horror Host Podcast UK here with another story to frighten you tonight. It is called Awaken by Zach Bohan. I awaken, shrouded in darkness. My first instinct is to feel around. I run my hands along the concrete slab I'm lying on. It is so cold, not so different then. When I lay in the middle of the road after the accident, the one I awake from every morning thinking of, I stand with no recollection of how I got here. The air around me carries a chill. This confuses me. I don't remember much, but I do remember that autumn still held the hand of summer when I was lost awoke. Wake. And where is exactly is here? Reaching for my ha- reaching my hands out in front of me, I try to find a wall or a door. Anything. As I wave my hands through nothing but air, the vulnerability makes me uneasy. For all I know I've been moving towards a cliff and step to my inevitable death at any moment. Now where it is I stop. The cold air coats my throat as I draw in a breath. After breath, I bring my hands together and clap. The sound reverberates and I realize I'm in an enclosed space. Hello, I call out and my voice echoes. It is if I am standing in the middle of a century where the conflagration has yet to gather. I reach into my pocket and bring my hand out, dressing what I am looking for. The small matchbox rests in my palm. I use my other hand to open it and withdraw a single stick. I push the head against the sandpaper side of the small box and strike the match, lightning it on the first try. I pull the match up in front of my face. I am given little light, though perhaps it's enough to figure out where I am. Each couple of feet I see what appears to be handles in the shape of torches fastened to the wall between each one of them. These handles, text is etched into concrete. I step closer to read it, but a match goes out. I sigh and strike another match and move closer to the wall. I squirt my eye, tired eyes and read. Harrison Stamel Downs, April 21st, 1878. June 13th, 1917, father, husband, son. I am in a mausoleum. What the hell am I doing in a mausoleum? Someone or something screams outside. Just as my second match reaches the end of its kindling, I turn around, following the direction of the howl. My hand is shaking, but I manage to withdraw another match. It drops from my hand, and it's so quiet in here, I can smell the small. I hear the small wooden stick bounce off the ground at my feet. Calm down, Andy, I tell myself, whispering. I can't, I grab another. Even though my hand won't stop trembling, it lights. I place a small flame in front of my eyes and turn until I see a door. I find it, but but a disturbing thought comes into my mind as I see the other dates carved in the walls around me. I have been sleeping among the dead. Something about it makes me me, me uncomfortable and sends a chill up my spine. 
I find a way out to put the other, to, I find a way to put the fault aside and try to open the door before I lose my light again. I reach out my hand and place my palm on the surface of the cold concrete door. Just before the match goes out, I fan the handle. My first instinct is to push, but the door doesn't budge. Am I going to be trapped in here? Left alone, one deceased surrounding me. I shake my fear. I try pulling the handle. The door is heavy, but it moves with a groan. I use all my strength to pull on the door. It opens. The wind whistles, and a chill of the night full pierces my skin. I reluctantly to stand outside, curious for the dead will protect me from the creature of the night. I smile nervously and shake my head. It must have been a coyote I heard. I tell myself, no big deal. I push the door further ajar and step outside under the moon. Two stones lie in the land in front of me, standing that seems like endless rows. The moon shines down upon them, seeking through the trees that stand at the edge of the yard. The stone dedications be old, but the grass is well kept. The last time I was in the graveyard was when I buried jewels and little rubby. I don't want to be here. I take the two steps down off the mausoleum and begin looking around for the nearest exit. I'm, uh, I just want to get home. My daughter is there. She must be scared, wondering where Daddy is. I, I have to leave this place of decay to get to her. That scream, it happens again. And then I am outside. I can hear that it's not far away. I can hear that it, that it is indeed no cruelty. It's something else. It is perhaps human. I am thankful that my legs seem full of strength. I start through the yard with haste. I pass tombstone after tombstone and aged angel statues. Searching for a way out, trying desperately to get to Emma. The child lost her mother at such a young age. She could be home right now, scaring the home for misplaced father. I hung hug her until the sun comes up when I get home. I may, in fact, never let go. Through the break in the bush that lines the edge of the cemetery, I see a street light. I move faster, feeling as if I am in a race against time to get back home and make sure that Emily is okay. I come to a road iron fence and wrap my hands around two posts, two of its posts. I look both ways down the structure unable to find a gate or an opening, so I climb. In mere seconds I scale the eight-foot fence and land on the sidewalk. Something growls nearby. I freeze, my arms are down my sides. I don't seem to move them. I can't seem to move them. The growl moves. The growl turns to a hiss, sounding like a large, angry dog. I turn around to face the source of the sound. My eyes widen, twenty paces or so down the sidewalk. Kneeling down between two of the light posts, there is a figure, a human-shaped figure. From the Ku Klux hairstyle, I can identify him as a male. I want to guess how old he might be, but my eyes go straight to his mouth, which is covered in thick blood. I gaze up to his eyes, which are pale, marked. Matching his milky white skin, he tilts his head to the side, and that's when I finally notice the sprawling legs on the sidewalk beside him, a hand quivering, almost as if it's trying to signal me. The new man hisses. I notice under the light that he's no man at all, but a creature. The body lying off on the concrete raises his head. 
I see the face of the young man. A chunk appears to have been taken out of his throat. He looks at me with empty eyes and mouths. Two words. Help me. The creature focuses back to its prey and mounts the man's neck. I hear the tearing of muscle and tissue above a hollowed out cry. The thing puts both its arms out and looks up to the sky, then spits out a large patch of flesh. The body underneath ceases to move, and the creature lets out a scream that sounds like a large bird from a B-movie horror. B-movie horror. I turn. I run like hell. I do not... I don't look back, I just run. I come to an intersection. I veer right to head down a different street. Looking around, I finally realize I, where I am. The diner, the laundromat, Sam Baker's shop, that, the, that, that boutique woman's clothing store. I am on Main Street. Home is only a mile away. My legs stop when I hear a sound crunch. Holding the nose, I turn my head towards Maggie's diner. Just like, like every other building on Main Street, its lights are off, but the sounds of it coming from behind the building. So carefully, make my way across the street and step to, onto the sidewalk. But the noise sounds as if it's coming from behind the building. So I carefully make my way across the street and step into the sidewalk. The closer I get, the more defined the noise come, becomes. Crunch, crunch. I heard around the side, I head around the side of the building. As I make my way towards the back, I see the shadow of a figure on a large wall. I follow its shape to the origin. My eyes come across the other creature. It stands in front of a dumpster, leaning towards something. I remain still that my heart punches inside my chest. My eyes widen. A person, a woman, I believe, is pinned to the dumpster by the creature's hand, wrapped around her throat. I look into her eyes. They are crimson red blood, spring each side of her neck, where the monster's head is buried. Her mouth moves, but no sound comes out. She looks as if she wants to scream, but her voice is apparently gone. A gruesome sound cease as a beast pulls back from the woman. It growls, then, then it slowly turns to look back at me, like the one I saw on the sidewalk. Its eyes are so pale, its teeth are stark grey. The thing hisses at me flashing his teeth, and though his face is covered in blood, I see the protruding fangs inside. The woman cannot be helped, but Emma, I turn around, I am running. I do not, I don't look back. I hear another howl in the distance. There's no other choice but to ignore it. I just keep running. I must get to my, own, live, my only living child. The entrance of my, some, the entrance to my subdivision it's only about another mile away. I keep churning my legs. Adrenaline must be pumping for me. Because I have no means. Because I am by no means tired. I feel I could run for the rest of the night. If I had to, I have started to realize that it's very possible that I might have to do, that, do just that. I reach my neighborhood without coming across another creature. In fact... I didn't even come across another human. I know it's late, but you think that someone would be outside. What the hell is going on? I'm, that was the thing I saw back there, and what, and what I thought it was. No time. As I turn into my neighborhood, just when I thought I wandered the night alone, a young woman bursts out of her front door and comes running out of her house. I don't know her. She is screaming for me to help her. But Emma, I can't stop. I don't. The same grotesque hell rings in my ears. The monster charges out of the house after the woman. 
It's only a matter of a time before she is caught, so I don't even turn around to see if she'll make it. Crunch, a scream, a woman's voice. Just keep going, Andy. Continuing down the sidewalk, I see something just a few paces in front of me. It's visible under the street, one of the street lights. I can see a mixture of white fur and red stained concrete. It's a dog. Hey, hey, fucking dog, Jesus Christ, I say. I can see my street now. A sign slightly off axis as always reads, A cold court. I take a hard ride and my house comes into view. It sits at the end of a cul-de-sac. Oh, in an old brick two-story home, far too much space for just two of us, but just right when there are four of us. If anything has happened to Emma, I know that Jules would be looking down on me with nothing but disappointment. The same guilt will fill my bones when I pulled out into the intersection, failing to see the drunk driver that side swoop, that side swoop us. I seem to catch another gear, chugging my legs like a freight train. My Honda is still parked in the driveway. That is, that's good. I am able to grab Emma and get the hell out of here. I arrive at the door and grab the handle. The door is locked. My keys, I reach into my pocket and scramble. For my keys, I find nothing but lint and mat, the matchstock. Wherever the, the, whatever... However, left me at the graveyard, must have taken my keys. I pang on the door and yell, Emma, Emma, honey, let me in. No response. Since I can't get inside through the front door, I decide to check the back. I jump off the porch, head to the side of the house. Emma, I call out again. Daddy, she says from inside. Finally responding, Daddy, come in and help me. I race around the back of the house. Thankful I haven't built that privacy fence I talked about. Our maple tree has lost much of its leaves, and the wind blows them around the yard in a frantic well. Another scream, perhaps from somewhere behind our house, draws my attention in the open air. It's so hard to tell. More creatures are close. No time. I refocus my attention on the house. And notice the back door is wide open. Daddy, I race inside. No lights are on. I reach over to the nearest switch, hoping the night that the kitchen will come to life. No such luck as I flip the, the switch multiple times to no avail. Emma, honey, where are you? We are, we are upstairs, she says. We are dark through the dining room towards the staircase. The front door is open, but not ajar, but wide open, just like the back door was. Has someone else entered my house? Oh, God. Grabbing onto the banister, I swing myself around and take the stairs two at a time until I reach the top. I head towards Emma's room, ignoring the family photos on the walls, as I always do. They are the ones that Emma insisted on keeping after the accident. Not wanting to lose the memory of her little brother and her mother. Emma's door is cracked. I barrel through it with my shoulder. Stopping just on, on the other side of the doorway when I see two familiar faces. Bradley, my neighbour Bradley, is standing in front of Emma, shielding her, apparently in case something got into the house. I open my arms and take a step towards my sweet Emma and say, Sweetie, I'm glad you're okay. Bradley draws a gun and clips it as he loads a bullet into the chamber. Daddy, Emma says, but Bradley's holding her back with his free hand. I raise my hands and chuckle. Bradley, what the hell are you doing? Stay back, Andy, Bradley says. I appreciate you looking after my daughter, I say, but the joke's over. Put the down the gun. He fires around, hitting the wall behind me. Emma screams. Be quiet, Bradley C. says. You'll draw the others. Others, I say? My wide, my eyes widen. Did you, did you, 
Did you have something to do with me waking up inside a museum? Museum? Brady's hands trembles. You just stay back, Andy. You hear? Stay away from us. She should have never invited you inside. A son of a bitch, I say. You had something to do with it? Do it, Andy. Kill him. That's what... What is that? My voice in my head. That is not my own. Daddy, I love you, Emma says. Kill him. I take a step forward. Looking around the room. Stay back, Brady says. I warn you. Who the hell is that? Who the hell is that talking to me? The gun goes off. Blink, blink, blink. I wake him up. Once again, lying on yet another hard cold, another hard surface, the air holds a cold breeze and dawn appears. It is ready to break. This calms me. As the night has been nothing but a horrid illusion, those monsters surely of the night must be gone by now. I shake my head and try to sit up, but I can't. What the hell? I look over and grasp. Not only are my wrists are bound, the palms of my hands have been pierced with nails, driven through the board which I am lying on. I raise my head, I look down it to my feet. And much of the time, much the same, my ankles are bound in the back of it. And a thick metal spike has been driven both through both my feet, just like Lord, the Lord, I am being crucified, but why? I don't know what else to do. I look to see Bradley standing behind me. He moves around to my side, and my eyes follow him. Nerves and things in my hands and feet must be shut because I don't feel an ounce of pain. What do you mean you didn't know what else to do? I asked. Let me go. Bradley sighs. I could not do that, Andy. Let me go, you son of a bitch, I yell. Where is Emma? Emma is safe and sound, he says. You don't worry about her. I'm going to take care of her. This is what's best for you. I couldn't bring myself to take you down in front of her. You sick bastard. You know all the shit she's been through. Yes, I do, and I'm sorry. I pull my hands, trying to feel my wrists. I pull up my hands, trying to feel my, free my wrists. It's futile. All I hear is a wet sound, a nail moving up and down from skin and tissue as blood continues to seep into the contract, concrete. He is leaving me here to die, to be devoured by those things. Bradley shakes his head. I actually find compassion in his face. It's not a look of hate, but one of guilt. He looks down at his watch. And then he looks towards the horizon. He kneels down past next to me, pats me on the shoulder and says, Good night, neighbour. You son of a bitch. By now I will get up from this. I am fucking kill you. But he simply walks away towards the house. My house, my Emma. I lay on my head, flat on the board beneath me, grasping the air. My stomach rises and falls, rises and falls. I scream. I look up again. A shadow is slowly disappearing on the street. Soon enough the light will hit me and I will be by baking in the sun. God, I hope the day won't be hot. There's no telling when anyone will find me or if any of, or any of my other neighbours survive the night. I let out a sigh as the sun's rays rain down on me. My head falls down. My head falls over towards my home. Through my, through her upstairs window, I see Emma. She's standing there, wiping her tears with one hand and holding the small brown bear I gave to her on her fourth birthday. She shakes her head, crying, and turns away. I face the sun and the Hair drips, a tear drops down my face and the sun. Oh, the sun, God, what is happening? It burns. 
Thank you for listening. I hope this story didn't creep you out so much. It's all a fright. Please don't scream tonight.